didn't hold Sarah to himself to become his wife. So it's thus she was restored. Due to restoration, we can see here at verse 14, that's the reason why he gave all, those, uh, all that livestock and those people to Abraham. If you recall with Pharaoh, he gave all that to Abraham to try to woo Abraham because he was, try, uh, he was going to marry into his family. However, this is the opposite. This is not because Abimelech's trying to woo Abraham. This is quite the opposite. Uh, he, he has to give up Sarah. So then why is he giving all of, this, all of these possessions to Abraham? The reason why is because of restoration. He's trying to restore the damage that he's caused. Because Abimelech knows God's judgment is on him, so he's trying to pay it back. Uh, you'll notice that as we continue reading at verse 15. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. So Abimelech is speaking here. The phrase, Behold, is used again. That means look, or uh, what he's about to say, pay attention to. He says that his land, his kingdom, is at his presence before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. You can live wherever you want. What pleases you. So you can see right here that he's trying to really uh, pay back Abraham with a lot of goods. Verse 16, and unto Sarah he said, so he's speaking to Sarah now. Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. So the phrase, uh, the word, behold, is used again. He's saying to her, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. So not only just livestock, slaves, and land, but also money. He also said, it's kind of, you can see right here, a bit of sarcasm. You can see a little bit of bitterness. He says to Sarah, instead of, I've given your husband a thousand pieces of silver, he said, I, give, I gave your brother a thousand pieces right, of silver. Right. So you can see he's not happy here, obviously. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus, okay, so meaning right here, behold is used again. So he's saying, pay attention to this particular part of the sentence. So his emphasis now with the word behold, that Abraham is supposed to be to Sarah a covering of the eyes. So what that phrase is used is basically she belongs to Abraham. Now, if you know about weddings, why is it that they have a veil? You ever wondered about that? The reason why the significance behind it is everything of her, where her exposure is for her husband, the veil where it's revealed, all right? But till then, her purity, her virginity, herself, her dignity remains within her. But then she's able to expose it when she lifts up the veil, share it with the man she belongs to. So the covering of the eyes, the veil, Abimelech is saying, is the thousand pieces of silver. So that's going to be your veil, your covering. And it's going to be a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee. So that means that everybody that's uh, with Sarah. Uh, continuing on here, he's saying that the thousand pieces of silver is basically like that veil to everybody that's uh, with Abraham and to anybody else out there. That way they can see, ah, she belongs to Abraham. Don't touch her. Because remember, the problem was, which was Abraham's fear, is that somebody's going to take my wife and kill me. So then a thousand pieces of silver is to, supposed to show, no, she belongs to him, and you should not touch her. Thus she was reproved. Okay, so Sarah was reproved, because you can see right here that uh, there was an, a tone of sarcasm, bitterness. I've given your brother, here's a thousand pieces of silver, make sure that this is known now that you belong to him. So she was being reproved by him. 
Now, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 22. You can notice the payment here. The context of what Abimelech is doing, giving livestock, livestock slaves, uh, money. It's, been a, it's a common sense thing throughout culture that even the law of Moses mentioned where a woman's dignity is at stake here, purity is at stake or sullied by another man, that there should be compensation for it. Look at Deuteronomy 22, and then we'll look at verse 19. And they shall immerse him in an hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife, he may not put her away all his days. Now, the context of the law right here is that there's a man who is discontent with this woman, uh, wants to put her away or gives her a bad name. So then the father of that woman, the father of that wife, wants reimbursement, wants compensation for that. So because the husband brought a bad name to her, ruined her reputation, through already sullying her, he's supposed to make uh, compensation and he's supposed to also make sure the marriage remains. So that's the context. But the bottom line of Deuteronomy 22, the reason why I'm turning to there, is it's a common sense thing, no matter what culture it is, that there should be some sort of monetary compensation if some woman's dignity and honor is sullied right here. Purity is sullied. That's the bottom line. So Abimelech knew that. That's why he reimbursed. Because remember, if you go back to Genesis chapter 20, Abimelech has that common sense mentality of morality, right. even if people here don't. Right. They just let women go off, get pregnant, and then get an abortion, and then they throw a flip because of Roe versus Wade because they can't go get away with their sin and let sin and impurity spread throughout the entire world. Yeah. Okay, that's the problem with people today. Even a pagan nation who's not as educated as you had more common sense. Because you'll notice right here at uh, verse 4 through 6, remember we read that before, Abimelech recognized himself as a righteous nation. At verse 5, he only did this by the innocency of hands when he was with Sarah. And then verse 6, God prevented him from touching her. So see, he had morals about touching. Abimelech had better sense about dating compared to today's generations, including Christians. Okay, anyway, let's go back to Genesis chapter 20. Pagan, remember, it's a pagan who had more common sense. Verse 17, so Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Okay, that's self-explanatory. Let me explain every word right here. See if the explanation matches up with every word in verse 17 and 18, okay? All right, the bottom line is Abraham prayed to God so that God can heal Abimelech, his wife, and then Abimelech's concubines, so his maidservants. Why? Because the Lord fast closed. In, uh, in other words, he immediately shut up the womb so that the womb does not open up and give birth. So the Lord, he did that earlier, and from hearing Abraham's prayer, he healed the women. So he had to do a healing process because he already shut them up. So biologically, he had to heal them so that the women can bring forth children. And the verse says they did. They were able to. So he fast, the verse says he fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. So everybody in Abimelech's household who was giving birth to children, the Lord shut up their wombs. Uh, why? The the reason is the last part of verse 18, because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. The Lord worded that specifically. Abraham's wife is Sarah. So that's why she should not be touched. That's why he worded it that way. Okay, uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 21 and verse 1 now. Genesis, oh, uh, by the way, the covering and the veil of Genesis chapter 20, verse 16. There are two verses we need to turn to that I forgot. All right, the first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then your second place is Genesis chapter 24. Genesis 24. Genesis 24 and 1 Corinthians 11. Genesis 24 and 1 Corinthians 11. Now, a little deep doctrine right here is that, you know, you women are actually open prey and hunting grounds for the fallen angels out there, for aliens, for Martians in outer space, right? You didn't know that? The reason why is because they don't have a female gender. So because they don't have a female gender, those angels, the ones that are particularly fallen, they want to mate with you or they want to have... Uh, they want to have sexual relationship with you. That's why Genesis chapter 6, <coughs> it was so bad and rampant that God had to drown them out with a flood. Had it not been for the fear of the Lord, those fallen angels would have taken over the world. The reason why they're not doing that is based on two things. One, because of God's judgment. The flood and then those Jews who were wiping out the Canaanites, which were the remnants of the fallen angels, their offspring. So then it's becoming very, very rare. But the second reason is because God put you women a veil. God has given you women a veil, a covering. And that's the reason why we strongly believe, as a Bible-believing church, that men and women, they should dress like Christians. And one of the rules for that is men should look like men, women should look like women. Because when men have those long hairs, we don't believe in that. Why? Because the long hair is supposed to be for the women. Because it's their protection, it's their covering from the fallen beings up there. Unless you men want to be approached by the fallen angel. <laughs> Cut your hair. Yeah. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Bible says right here, in verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For, okay, so then if a man covers, then he's dishonoring. But if the woman is uncovered with her head, then she's dishonoring. So that means the man should be more of the uncovered part and the woman should be covered, right? That's the bottom line. Okay, what does that mean? What is the covering and the uncovering? If you keep reading down at verse 5, it says, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Ah, then it has to do with your hair then. Right. Has to do with your hair. If you look at verse 6, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. See, it has to do with the hair. It has to do with the hair. Now, why does the woman have to be covering her head with her hair? Because of verse 10, verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of who? Because of the angels. So it's the veil of protection. Now, you women got to realize this. Sarah had thousand pieces of silver. You women, your hair, that's your thousand pieces of silver. Wow. Don't betray that for stupid, wicked women's lid. Yeah. Okay? Right. You just given up yourself, basically. Okay. All right, Genesis chapter, uh, oh, Genesis chapter 24. Notice it was common throughout that time that when you're about to... Uh, when you are about to have a sexual unity, when the purity, the dignity of isolation is about to be given up and conjoined with another man, notice right here the veil, the covering is involved. Genesis chapter 24. And that's why weddings, they have that. Verse 65. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Look at this. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. So that's natural during uh, weddings. That's why they have that. All right, go back to Genesis 21. Genesis chapter 21. Now let's look at verse 1. We're going to finally cover the story of Ishmael and Isaac. Now we can move on. And then if we have some time, we're going to cover the latter part of Abimelech. 
Verse 1 says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. So, if you recall, the Lord said to Sarah at Genesis chapter 18 that he's going to visit her sometime in the future. So, he did pay Sarah a visit. What did he do in this visit? The second part of the verse says, And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. What the Lord did in his visit, he did something to Sarah where she was able to give birth to a child. So she was able to be in conception and give birth to a son, to Abraham, in spite of his old age, in spite of how old Abraham was. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. Notice right here that when Abraham was able to, get, uh, to have a son, it was at the appointed time, what God set up where he already told him at Genesis 18. Remember, he had an appointed time. And I explained some interesting things about God where he sets up appointments. So I'm not going to do that here. Verse 3, And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Okay, meaning that Abraham, he called his son by a specific name. It was Isaac, the son that was born to him, uh, whom Sarah was able to give birth. His name was Isaac. The reason why is because God told him that at Genesis chapter, was it 17, I think, or 16? Yeah, I think it was 17. Yeah, it was 17. It was chapter 17. Then uh, 18 should be, let's see right here. No, no, 18's right. Yes, yeah, so 17, thank you. So Genesis 17 was where God told him to call him Isaac. So Abraham called him Isaac. Remember, Isaac means laughter. Isaac means laughter. Why? Because Abraham and Sarah are able to laugh because it is so ironic, it is so funny that a per people at their age give birth to children. So that's why there is something funny behind it. The Lord your God has a sense of humor. He has a funny way of doing things, right? That's why even the lost world would have a saying that God works in mysterious ways, which is very, very true. Verse 4, And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. Okay, meaning right here that Abraham performed circumcision on his baby boy Isaac once he reached the age of eight days old. Why? Because that was God's specific command at Genesis 17, which I showed you at the book of Leviticus. And that was very significant because it had to do where, uh, the bleed, uh, where their blood level and vitamin K would reach its highest at the eighth day for babies, believe it or not. That's the reason why God timed it right for circumcision for the babies. So I already explained that at Genesis 17. Verse 5, And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Okay, meaning that Abraham was 100 years old when his own son Isaac was born to him. Now in verse 6, And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that here will laugh with me. So Sarah speaking, God makes, uh, made me laugh. Why would God make her laugh? It's so that everybody else that hears her laugh can laugh along with her on how great our God is. Amen? Verse 7, And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? So she's speaking right here, who would, have, who would have said to Abraham back then that, you know, Sarah would one day be able to give children suck, would be able to feed children one day, through her, uh, be able to nurture children. For I have borne him a son in his old age, because she gave birth to a son at Abraham when he was very old. So who would have said that, right? So that's something funny to talk about, so she's laughing, and she wants all to hear it and laugh along with her. Verse 8, And the child grew and was weaned. So, when the child grew up, Isaac, 
uh, he was being weaned. Now, when he was weaned, it was at that time, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. When Isaac reached the proper age, when he was weaned, then Abraham started to make a big feast and a party at that day when Isaac reached that age. So what age was Isaac at that time? So we can guess it will be two to three years old. And the reason why is because of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. So when the child was weaned. So what does that mean? So look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. The idea is when the baby uh, stops drinking the mother's milk. So it's about that time when he's at that age, past it, then he's considered to be weaned or uh, any child. 1 Samuel chapter 1, we'll look at verse 20. We'll look at verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel. Okay, so notice right here she gave birth to Samuel. Look what happens at verse uh, 23. And Elkanah, her son, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him. So then, in other words, uh, the husband is saying to Hannah that you can stay with the baby boy. You don't have to leave until you've weaned him. Okay, what's weaning him then? Only the Lord established his word, so the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. See that? So the weaning part is when the baby stops drinking the mother's milk. Verse 24, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks. So see, he's weaned now, Samuel. So that's the idea. When the uh, baby stops drinking or the child stops drinking the mother's milk. Okay, Genesis chapter 21. So we would say that uh, Isaac at this time, here are several things that we covered. Isaac is about uh, two to three years old. Then how old is Ishmael at this time? Ishmael, he would probably be at the age of 15 to 16 years of age. Now, uh, why is that? We're going to look at the next verse and then I'll explain it. The verse says at verse uh, 9, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Okay, so notice right here that Sarah sees Hagar, remember she's an Egyptian. Hagar's son, Ishmael, which she had born unto Abraham. So Hagar is the one that gave birth to Ishmael through Abraham. Ishmael is Abraham's son. She sees him mocking about the party, about Isaac. Now you could probably guess why, because he's getting a lot of attention now. And Isaac is the promised child from God, not Ishmael. So then uh, it would be probably be obvious that Ishmael is jealous. Uh, he's not happy about it, and he would mock Isaac. At this time, why would he be 15 to 16 years of age? Because well, we go to Abraham, how old he was. Abraham at verse 5 is 100 years old, right? So let's put a timeline right here. So then Abraham... Abraham is a hundred. So let's put Abraham here. And I'm going to put a smaller print. And then I'm going to put uh, two to three for Isaac. And then uh, 15 to 16 for Ishmael here. Okay, it's going to be at this line, okay? So sometime at this line. Now, we would say two to three for Isaac. If we say two to three, look at uh, Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17. Genesis chapter 17, and then we're going to look at verse 24. 
The Bible says, And Abraham was ninety years old and nine, when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So the Bible says Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised. Now Ishmael, he was thirteen, you'll notice, at verse 25, right? And Ishmael, his son, was thirteen years old. So we're going to put right here, Abraham is ninety-nine. And then Ishmael right here is 13. Now, remember, Abraham was 100, right? If he's 100 when Isaac was born, then that means this 100 should go here. Because he's 99 here, right? All right. Now, when you go back, uh, when was Isaac born? It was when he, Abraham was 100, right? At verse 5? Okay, verse 5, Abraham was 100 years old. Genesis 21, 5, when his son Isaac was born unto him. Okay, so that means one year later, okay? So one year later, 100. So this gap right here is about one year. Okay, one year... Isaac's born, okay? Now we say he had to be weaned, right? So then right here, he's, uh, he's born, then give it two to three years later, right here, okay? So then two to three years later. Remember, Ishmael is how old here? 13, okay? So then when we go one year passing by, that will be 14. And then from 14, if you give it about two to three years, then he will be about uh, 16 to 17, okay? So it'll be about 16 to 17 years of age. Uh, I put 15 just to be on the safe side. Let's see, he was 13, so 15, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, that is right. Okay, so he's about, uh, three years or four years off. So then it'll be 16 to 17 years of age. I'll just do that just to not cause confusion, okay? So let's put 16 to 17. Let's say he reaches somewhere there, okay? It's possible he could be 15, but let's just put it there, give and take. You don't really need to know the exact year, and some people might make a big deal about it. Why? Because that's a contradiction in scripture. Uh, that's a foolish thing to say when you got fossils that are millions of years off from each other. The fossil is 500 million to 800 million years old. That's a 300 million year gap, okay? It's common sense that when you date from ancient history, you can give it a couple years off, okay? All right, so no, you did not disprove the Bible if there's a one year gap, okay? You're just being silly, okay? Let's go back to Genesis 21. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 21. So we can see that Ishmael would be probably 16 years of age when he was mocking Isaac. Verse 10, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. So Sarah is now saying to Abraham, uh, Cast out. So uh, get rid of the slave and her own son. So you can see Sarah's not happy here. Get rid of the slave and her boy. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So she's saying right here, the son of this slave right here is not going to be heir uh, with my boy Isaac. My boy is the one who's the heir, Isaac. Verse 11, and the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. So obviously to Abraham's perspective, his point of view, his sight, the thing that Sarah said really grieved him. Why? Because of Ishmael. It's his boy. It's his son. He's his son. <clears throat> Verse 12, And God said unto Abraham, so God speaks to Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. So God says to Abraham, Don't let this thing grieve you uh, from how you see it because of the boy and because of the slave. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God says, whatever Sarah said to you, listen to her, what she said. So her voice, 
So what she said, listen to her, because Isaac is where your seed is going to be called. What we call the seed of Abraham is Isaac. It's not Ishmael. Amen. It's not a bunch of Muslims saying that uh, we are the seed of Abraham. No, you cannot do that because the reason why is who we call the seed of Abraham is Isaac. Now, it is true that in a sense, physically, that the Arab nation, if they do come from Ishmael, that they are Abraham's seed, but they're not called Abraham's seed. Now look at the wording right here. Verse 13, and also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. So God says, also the son of the bondwoman, so Ishmael, son of Hagar, the slave, I'm going to make him a nation, so don't worry. Why? Because he is still your seed. So notice right here, God recognizes Ishmael's line as Abraham's seed, but he says in the last part of verse 12, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So who he calls gives the title, the official title, the name of the seed of Abraham is the Jewish people, not Ishmael. Even though Ishmael's descendants, they are the seed of Abraham, they are not called that. That's not their official title. Okay, so that's what we understand. Another thing at verse 12, this is good for you women. Trust me, you women want to highlight this one because this is where you can have a little bit of liberty. There are verses in the Bible women are troubled about, and I've used this verse before to explain about Sarah at uh, Genesis 18. There are so many verses about women keeping silence uh, in the churches and also being silenced in subjection to the husband. And women are wondering, well, that means that I cannot uh, voice my own, two, uh, I can't give my own two cents. That's not true. You'll notice right here at verse 12 that this is your verse, women, that uh, even though a woman's emotion is involved right here, and maybe she, w uh, from how I see it, she was fleshly when it, she said it. But nevertheless, God still, God was still behind what she stated. Right. So a lot of times it's easy for us husbands to ignore the women because they're in an emotional state. Well, you're just saying that because you're angry. You're not in your right mind. And it's easy for us to say that. And we are right. We are right. You got to be in your right mind. You got to have the right spirit to do it. But nevertheless, it is difficult for us men. We have to look behind that and see if the Lord has something behind it. And you might want to open your ears and listen to her. All right. Yeah, I, I only heard women saying amen. That's so hilarious. I only hear women saying amen. Men. Yeah. This is so funny. There are two verses to support the women, okay? So I know you men don't like this, so let's hurry up with these verses. I'll go through it super fast. 1 Samuel 25 and 2 Samuel 20, all right? 1 <laughs> Samuel 25, 2 Samuel 20. Hurry up, guys. I want to bypass this. I don't want my wife to hear this. All right. 1 Samuel 25, 2 Samuel 20. Some woman saying, I'm going to tell her, you know? <laughs> all right. 1 Samuel 25, 2 Samuel 20. I did not use 1 Corinthians 14, but this is just my own opinion, so that's why we're not turning to this verse. But it's interesting, uh, but I have to study it into it more. So you don't have to write it down, you don't have to look at it, but I'll just give this as a side note. 1 Corinthians 14, I wanted to add that verse too because it's very, very powerful. It shows that women are to keep silence, but it shows right here that they are not to speak out in church. However, they can speak out to their husband. That was pretty powerful, that verse. That's what it appeared like to me at 1 Corinthians 14, meaning that you women do, can have an opinion. You can say something to your, to your husband. It gave you that right. It gave you that power at 1 Corinthians 14, actually, even though the context was about women keeping silence. So that was pretty interesting. But anyway, I cannot really prove that, all right, because uh, I have to take some time. I know you women want me to prove it, so you pray about it. That way I can prove it, okay? But I can't really prove that. I need some more time to look into that verse. But if my, if my guess on that verse is correct, then that's going to be very helpful for women in the future. And you might want to use 1 Corinthians 14 in context of women keeping silence, but they can speak out 
They have a sense of speaking out. Okay, but anyway, 1 Samuel 25. If this woman didn't speak out and the man didn't listen to this woman's advice, he would have sincerely messed up and sinned. You'll notice right here that uh, verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, so the husband is in the wrong here. He's not doing anything. So Abigail has to do something herself. So what she did was at verse 23, and when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass. And verse 24, and fell at his feet and said, and then she's speaking to David at verse 24 and 25 and 26. She's telling him, don't kill Nabal in the household. Let the Lord handle him. Well, did David said, be quiet, woman. You know, you have no say in this matter. Tell me something spiritual. No, notice what David said. You'll notice that David at verse 32, and David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me and blessed be thy what? Advice. So see, notice women that you can speak out. You can give advice. Uh, look at 2 Samuel chapter 20. 2 Samuel chapter 20. So when we say women keeping silence, the idea is this. The idea is who's in authority, who's in leadership. You have to look at the context. The bottom line is as long as the wife is under submission of her husband. And in the church and in the ministry, the woman is not in a leadership role and position. Okay? So that's the bottom line of what the Bible says to be in silence. But God knows that you know, that's the general rule and that's the atmosphere you give, but that doesn't mean that you keep your mouth shut and you cannot give an opinion at all. No, you can give an opinion while still being under submission of the church and of the husband. That's very important. You'll notice that at um, uh, 1 Samuel, you'll notice right here, Abigail is not trying to dominate leadership over David. You notice that right there? Not even against her own wicked husband, Nabal, actually. She did it underneath her husband's nose. So you notice right here, as long as that atmosphere, that testimony is given of submission, you women can speak out. And yes, men should listen to women. At least once in a blue moon, man. <laughs> yeah, 2 Samuel chapter 20. Now look at this one. 2 Samuel chapter 20. Notice how the Holy Spirit words this woman at verse 16. Then cried a what? Wise woman out of the city. Hear, hear, say I pray you unto jo Joab. Come near here that, that I might speak with thee. So see, she's speaking out. She's not under silence. She's speaking out. And then what happens at verse 17, 18, uh, that they are discussing. But look at verse 18. Then she spake, saying, they were wont to speak in old times, saying, they shall surely ask counsel at Abel. And so they ended the matter. I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Now look at verse 22. Then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off uh, let's see right here. And they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bikri, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent. You'll notice right here that she's the one speaking out. And also, at verse 22, the whole city. So this is bigger than a church and the home. This is a whole city right here. Right. A woman can speak out, and the whole city can listen to her. Right. And the Holy Spirit calls her actually wise. Okay, go back to Genesis 21. Genesis 21. Mm -hmm. So notice right here that you women, uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot speak out or you can't give your own opinion. You can, all right? But the bottom line is your testimony has to be, nevertheless, submission. It has to show a good testimony of silence as well. Usually, you have to understand this, ladies. The reason why the Bible says so much about silence for women is that... Uh, don't get upset at me, you know, but from what I look at the Bible, it's this, okay? 
So you women have a problem with this. That's the reason why the Lord had to put a rule on that one. But that doesn't mean you go mute and that uh, you get so much stress level high and you can't uh, speak out what's in your heart or give your two cent, okay? All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 21. And then uh, we'll look at verse 14. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Okay, let me move around here. So uh, let me explain every word right here. Abraham uh, got up early in the morning. He took uh, some uh, bread and then a bottle of water, gave it to Hagar, and then put the, you can guess that bottle of water is basically that strap, putting it on her shoulder, and then gave her the child as well, and then sent Hagar away. And then Hagar, she departed, she left, and she was wandering in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now remember that uh, Abraham, he's somewhere over here, okay? So this is the, uh, the sea over there, this is the Dead Sea. Remember, Abraham is somewhere right here, okay? So then she's wandering in the wilderness of Beersheba. So remember, when there are cities uh, that have specific names, sometimes the area and terrain could be named after a particular city as well. So then the wilderness of Beersheba, she's wandering somewhere there. You can guess where she's heading toward. She's heading toward Egypt because she, she is Hagar the Egyptian, or at least areas that's akin to Egypt, okay? So she's traveling down there. Uh, notice your King James Bible has an error in the word. It says, and a bottle of water. Obviously, they didn't have bottled water that time. So your King James Bible has an error. And then some people get so weirdo mode that they talk about the Mandela effect. And one of the evidences your King James Bible changed was because they put uh, modern words like bottle and other words, etc. There's no bottle back then. Now, uh, silly, all you have to do is go to an... Uh, do you know what etymology means? Yeah. Go to, basically, type the word bottle in an online etymology site, and when you do that, you'd be surprised what bottle can mean. Right. Bottle, during that time, it can mean uh, that strap or that uh, wine skin or, you know, whatever they used that time. I, I, I bet you it was skin that time that they used as a covering, uh, as a bottle, so to speak, right. for the water. That's the idea. Because, look, when you talk about your emotions are bottled up, what does that mean? Plastic with a cap on it? Yeah. No, bottled up means, see, there's like some kind of, uh, some kind of, um, uh, well, how, some entity or substance that's building up inside a covering. See, that's the idea. So bottle is fine, okay? No, that's not an error in your King James Bible. It's an error of your brain cells, your IQ, okay? That's what it is. Now let's look at verse 15. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. So this is really, really sad. You'll notice right here that... Uh, the bottled water that she had, uh, bottled water, excuse me, so then the, the, wa uh, the bottle or the skin that she was carrying uh, with her, the water was spent. In other words, it's gone. So you know the, uh, the word, like, I spent my money. Mm -hmm. So then that f word can be used concerning about uh, any substance that's actually gone or used up. That's the idea. So the water was used up. And then she cast, so basically she left the child, that's the idea, underneath the shrub here, underneath one of the shrubs, because you can see that she's depressed, the child is uh, getting weary, and she's getting weary, and she did that because she doesn't want to see him die. Look at verse 16. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off. Meaning that once she left him under the shrubs, cast him under the shrub, that's the idea, she went off, and when she went, she sat, she sat her down. So she sat herself down, that's the idea, against him. So like the opposite, that's the idea. Against means opposite. The opposite of him, a good way off. So a good distance between them. 
uh, how far is the distance? As it were, a bow shot. So it's about a bow shot distance, you know, when you do the bow and arrow and like that. So it's like a bow shot. That's the idea, what it means. So about that much distance she put between them. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. So she said, once she was away at a good distance off, I don't want, I don't want to see my child die. Please don't let me see my child die. Mm -hmm. So she's probably praying to the Lord right here. That's why she said that. And then she sat over against him. So it repeats again. She's sitting at the opposite where he's at. She lifted up her voice. So she was uh, crying out. And then she also wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? So God, he hears the voice of actually. Notice it's not Hagar here. It's Ishmael. So God hears Ishmael's pain and groaning. And then, uh, so then the angel of God then calls to Hagar out of heaven. So God not only hears uh, Hagar who was weeping, God also heard Ishmael as well. God's a compassionate God. He's not going to pick and choose uh, who he's going to hear. Right. So God says to Hagar from out of heaven, so he's speaking from up there, okay? So he's speaking to her out of heaven. Uh, what bothers you, Hagar? Aileth. So what pains you, right? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. So God's comforting her. Hey, don't be afraid. I heard, I heard Ishmael's voice, how much he's in pain, where he's at. I hear him. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand. So God says to Hagar, get up, all right, pick up the boy, your boy, and you can hold him again. So that's the idea. That phrase is, hold him in thine hand. In other words, uh, you can hold him again. You can be able to keep him. Uh, he won't die. That's what that phrase is used for. For I will make him a great nation, because I'm going to make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So God uh, provided a well of water for her, and he made her see that. He opened her eyes. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. So she went over to where the well of water was. She filled up the bottle. And remember, that's referring to the old days, that skin, all right? Uh, she filled that skin with water, and then she gave her boy water to drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. So God, he was always with Ishmael, and Ishmael, he, he grew up, and then he dwelt, he was living off in the wilderness, because they were out in the wilderness, they might as, uh, they were out in the wilderness, they might as well live in the wilderness, make their home in the wilderness. Ishmael, he became an archer, so he was able to become a hunter for food. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so Ishmael, he lived, he lived in the wilderness of Paran. You'll notice Paran is down here. That's south of the Dead Sea, actually, right here. So Beersheba's right there. So when they were wandering, it's a big wilderness. And then they just, uh, Ishmael, he just ended up right here, actually. They didn't actually go all the way to Egypt. They decided to just reside and live out here. So... He lived out there in the wilderness of Paran, and then the mother, because it's so close to Egypt, she got her son Ishmael a wife out of Egypt. So then Ishmael was able to have his own uh, seed, his own family, his own nation down there. Let's look at verse 22 now. Verse 22. So let me write down a couple things here for Ishmael and Isaac. So one, Hagar and Ishmael, they were wandering in the wilderness. They were suffering. They were in distress. We read about that. And we saw their location, where it was at, what the Lord provided. So then the next part we observed is the Lord saved them. God saved their lives and was with him. So God was always with Ishmael. You notice that? Remember, that's a, that's a great verse because if you recall back at the 
previous verse at Genesis, Hagar, she's just a pagan, but she gave the name of a place about God is with me. You remember that one? So the Lord never forgot his promise. He was always with Ishmael. He put his hand of blessing upon his nation, and then they became a great people. That's why even today, the Arab people, and a lot of them would claim that they're from Ishmael's line. That's the reason why they're able to continue on today. It's because of what God promised their descendants. Now we're going to look at verse 22. Uh, and it came to pass at that time, uh, so and it came to pass, so uh, that's a phrase obviously used, uh, what happened after that. At that time, so it's around that time, so we don't know really when, but it's around that time when Ishmael uh, start to grow and start to live out in the wilderness of Paran, that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham. So remember Abimelech, the king, who, uh, who wanted Abraham to just go away, but he has his chief captain in charge of his army. So his host means an army group. That's what the phrase is, uh, the word is used occasionally in the Bible. So both of them spoke to Abraham. And what they said to Abraham is, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Okay, so they see that whatever Abraham does, God's hand is on him. So they see God blessing Abraham. And you can guess if you look at what Abraham did. One, he's extremely rich. Two, he has his uh, son Isaac through a miraculous birth. I'm sure they got wind of that one. Right. So then they see how prosperous Abraham is, how God is blessing him. So then Abimelech and Phicol realize that God is with Abraham. So what they want to do is they want to make a covenant with him because they can see God's blessing him, making him a great nation. So then sometime in the future, they don't want some kind of conflict. Right? So that's why in verse 23, Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou will not deal falsely with me. So that's why Abimelech says, I want you to make a promise, covenant with me. I want you to swear here by God, swear by God that you're not going to have false dealings with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, nor with my children, my grandchildren. But according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me. Whatever kindness that I gave to you, I want you to do the same in respect and return. Because in the future, he does want Abraham to become rich and powerful, and they come across conflict. And to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. So also, don't forget the land where you're sojourning. So remember, sojourning doesn't mean live, but like temporarily residing that you'll also remember that land that you are sojourning, that you'll bestow kindness thus upon this land, upon our people. So he makes a covenant with Abraham, and he sees God's blessing with Abraham, which is why he wants to uh, make, uh, make some kind of deal with him. We're going to look at uh, several passages, how the lost people observe you. Genesis 39 and 1 Peter 3. Genesis 39 and 1 Peter 3. And then we'll close it off here. Genesis 39 and then uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. And we'll close it right here. In order for you Christians to have the lost world open their eyes and see God God's hand is on you. How do you do that? Well, I don't know if you've been through this before, but you ever been blessed by the Lord so much and then you always told your family and your friends, it's not me, it's the Lord. And they knew your suffering before and your conditions before and then all of a sudden these miracles happen and you got blessed and your bills taken care of and uh, you got a nice home or nice physical things in life, uh, nice job, stuff like that. And then your family observed that, your loved ones and people around you saw that, and they're like, there's no doubt that you got something, that maybe there is a God. Maybe I'll get saved. You ever noticed that before? You know what I'm talking about? So then how they can observe your, test, your testimony is based on two things, where they can see God's hand is on you. One is God's blessing, obviously, which we see in this case. 
And another example is Genesis 39 that will support it. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. See? So God's blessing Joseph with prosperity. Look at verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So notice one thing, how they can notice God's blessing is on you, is prosperity. Prosperity. How they can know God is with you is prosperity. The second thing how they can notice God is with you is testimony. Testimony. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. But let's be honest, we don't believe in the health and wealth gospel, do we? Right. Like the charismatics. So then they think that you're spiritual, you're right with God if you're richly blessed, if you're prosperous. Now it is true that there are times that when God blesses you that you become prosperous. It's a sign of God bless, uh, that God is with you, no doubt. But, you know, there's another part that we should recognize. Another part that you and I can recognize is it don't happen all the time God gives you physical prosperity. Right. Right. But there's no doubt God is with you when you're going through a fire, through a suffering, through a loss. That don't mean you're not right with God. So look at 1 Peter chapter 3, <coughs> verse 14. But, and if he suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Verse 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers... See, when you're, going th uh, when you're going through suffering, hardship, and the world talks down on you, oh, yeah, see what Christianity did for you? Made you poor. You gave up your nice job, your school, your future because of church, because of serving God, and you drop that good girl, that good guy that you could have had a great future, and, you know, they're going to speak evil of you. But look at this at verse 16, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that he suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. The point is when you suffer, when you go through hardship, it's not a sign of God abandoning you. It's a sign of where you keep rejoicing in the Lord, praying, have faith, and have a good attitude during hardship that convicts them. So when they talk down on you, make fun of you, look, they're going to feel some yeah. sort of guilt. Right. Or they're going to remember what they said about you years ago, and then the Lord's going to bother them. Amen. And then in the future, they're going to keep observing your testimony, and they're going to see how much you matured. Right. And that's right. going to convict them and change yeah. them. Yeah. Okay, so then there are two things how you can have the lost. This is important. Amen. Uh, if you want the lost world to recognize that God's hand is on you, it's on two things. One is on how God blesses you. The second is how your testimony is during suffering. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Now, Father, I want to thank you so much for your word and for your truth so that we can grow in it and be able to live our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.